guys, first and foremost, I want to thank Michael for coming on here. Huge shout out, the creator of MetaZoo and also competitor, also great friend of mine, Easton Evans on here as well to do this interview with me. Michael, thank you so much for your time. No, I appreciate it. And I know that you guys are busy too. So um, I'm glad that we all have an opportunity to talk. Yeah, absolutely. Easton, I'll let you break it off. We'll go question for question and then kind of add on as we go. If you want to go ahead and start, go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, So, Mike, we really were wondering, like, for the community behind the, like, behind MetaZoo, what was kind of your, like, experience with TCGs and kind of what, like, led you to start MetaZoo and even kind of get it off the ground? Sure. So, you know, I was... As a kid, I was always um, a huge collector of, of Pokemon and, uh, you know, much more of a player of Magic, though. But, um, you know, I got from like a product perspective, I definitely liked Pokemon more. Magic the Gathering for me and my friends in, in middle school and high school was much more of a, uh, uh, you know, a reason to, to get together and play. And you know, I was actually growing up in Brazil. You know, there was this weird kind of... Um, <laughs> balance where we have, you know, with collectability and playability where, you know, the Brazilian cards were written in Portuguese and had, you know, they're more readily available, but everyone wanted English cards. And, um, you know, a lot of our American friends couldn't even read the Portuguese cards. So we had, had like these crazy house rules about, you know, what cards did and didn't do. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I think obviously that cooled off during college where, you know, Pokemon and, and magic kind of, hit this lull period um and it really i really re-entered into the the scene in in 2016 uh with pokemon go and i think a lot of people in our age range uh experience a similar thing where they're like oh crap you know i i actually like this and and it and for whatever reason even beyond nostalgia the the current product resonates with me and i can continue to play and um you know, so so for me, that was kind of my renaissance of of, of rediscovery, where um, Pokemon and Magic, you know, reentered in my life, and and I was way too busy to do anything competitive. So, you know, I I started kind of dissecting them as an adult um, from like a, a product perspective. So, um, and that you know naturally led to me thinking, hey, wouldn't it be cool if I could create my own TCG? Awesome, awesome. Thank you for that. Great. You know, and I've listened to a lot of your the podcasts you've been on and stuff like that. And it's crazy how you started with, I think you'll find this very funny in the car, I think with your girlfriend changing the names and stuff and kind of coming in where Metadu <laughs> kind of just stuck, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, for me, it was, it was, I, a lot of this was like back in the napkin stuff where I'd, I'd wake up or, you know, I'd be sitting in bed and it'd be like 1 a.m. and I'd be emailing myself card ideas. And that goes back again all the way to, to 2016. Um, but, you know, I was at, at Columbia doing, you know, my PhD. And, <clears throat> and I was thinking, you know, it'd be really cool. Obviously, I, c- I can't create my own TCG. So wouldn't it be cool if I just printed my own cards and, you know, maybe do this as kind of like an art project, right? Um, but it was honestly, you know, a, a, a creature of frustration where, um, or a byproduct of frustration where, you know, I bought these, you know, UV printers from, um, you know, China that were really expensive. And I was setting them up and, and, and working them, you know, while doing homework and, and research and not really successfully creating holographic cards. Um, but really, you know, my... Uh, Uh, you know, Jesse and I, my, my girlfriend at the time, Harlem, um, f- finding ways to create holographic cards for her jewelry business. And so really the, the very first cards that I handmade were um, these cards for her uh, jewelry business that were more like coupons, right? So you could use them for like redemption. Um, and we stick those into the, into the products that we sold uh, like through Etsy, for instance. So, um, yeah, it was cool. It was a cool experience. It was, it was a really memorable experience. And I think it was the right kind of, of, uh, Genesis story for something like MetaZoo where it really was grassroots and it really was something that came up very naturally. 
Um, and I'm really happy that MetaZoo is the first one on the scene because it could have that natural story. Absolutely. And I, we en- enjoy it. I read the comic, so like I, I can see the, where it's going now and it's really intriguing. So I look forward to the TV show, but I know we came here for some of the competitive questions and I'll get with you on those on another time. But coming to the Collecticon DFW, I know you've dropped some information, but is there any details outside the Caster Cup that you have not posted or shared that you could share with us, maybe rulings, guidelines? Um, so, you know, I know that it's been historically so that certain fourth wall things were not taken into account. You know, for instance, um, anything that was considered private info, like um, Fountain of Youth, for instance, requiring that you reveal your age and, and how that has always been zero or in some cases, no. Um, we're, we're walking that back a bit because, you know, that's kind of the, the point of the goddamn game is to have those four, fourth wall effects in place. Right. Um, and, and there, there's going to be this transition from what was, or what has been easy to what n- the game needs to be, uh, from a, you know, maintaining or, or, or keeping with the spirit of the game. Right. So, you know, and I knew, you know, with the caster cup, it'd be difficult because uh, the requirements are, are, are a problem, right? Um, you know, the, the san- it has to be sanctioned play, it has to be in person. Um, you have to have an MZO oversee it. There can't be online sanctioned play. Um, you know, it has to be, you know, in our system and all these other things. And, and the amount of creativity that I've seen about people trying to, work around this system um, is tremendous and, and kind of commendable. <laughs> but the point is, is that it's supposed to be hard, right? right. Like if, if, if we are going to take competitive play seriously, um, we have to get over this hurdle that was, a you know, these things were created out of necessity because of COVID, right? Mm-hmm. Our, all of our play testing has been online. I have people in my, who are employees who I've never met because we're all working remotely. And you might think, oh, doesn't that make it easier? It's like, you know, tell that to my, my lawyers who are coming up with, with how to pay these people and what taxes to pay um, when they're all, you know, spread all over Vermont and DC and some of them are in Canada. It's, it's, uh, it's crazy, right? right? But we are moving out of that. And so the way that we have historically done things is going to change because it needs to. Otherwise, organized play in MetaZoo is not going to be something that people take seriously. Right. And I know that sucks. And I get the messages about, you know, people saying like, why can't there be online sanctioned play that ca- counts towards the caster cup? Or can we use an MZO that is online? And it's like, no, I understand those things make it easier. But the answer is no. And I agree with you. Something I brought up to Easton, you know, we were talking about the qualifications and honestly, like I back you in what you're doing because what you're going to, you're going to do is force people. And I always say, when you, when you apply pressure, you're going to create diamonds or coal, right? So in applying that pressure to have people to find the MZO, find a location to get, get qualified, they're going to find a way. If you build it, they'll come. So you built it. Now they're going to figure out how to come. And so, or they won't, right? Because, you know, and I, I've seen this on Facebook too, because I'm, I'm a glutton for punishment and I read those comments, <laughs> comments right? Where <laughs> people were like, man, I have to have an MZO in my store. Like, you know, the, you know, it's, it's a joke that MetaZoo even requires this, yada, yada. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to order any more MetaZoo from them. These are the same people, by the way, who complain, store owners, mind you, who complain about um, MetaZoo not having a competitive scene, Right. Um, And so I know that we can maximize the number of players at the Caster Cup, um, but create a house of cards in terms of of our organized play network. Um, I would rather there be fewer people. I would rather there be 25 people um, at the Caster Cup who are are competing um, that have gotten there because they followed this harder road um, than, you know, creating easy shortcuts that aren't setting up our organized play for the long term. Got you. Go ahead, Easton, on question three. Okay. Um, So when planning the Caster Cup, uh, what was the target audience as far as like 
re- retaining and capturing players and kind of why was that like in terms of like did the format have to do with anything with what we're hearing about blitz like was the format in, in any kind of thought process when trying to gain these players or retain these players that might be attempting to play at the caster cup i wanted to, to uh perk the ears up of competitive players across different games um, i think that we're doing that um and i also want to show with things like blitz at the fourth wall um angle to this and blitz is that fourth wall angle to it's it's almost like purest or most fun form i think mm-hmm. that it's viable yeah, um, sure. and we're putting a lot of money behind it and um i think it's going to be successful and i think it's going to be something that we can point to like I make you know i i'm not under the impression that that metazoo fourth wall effects and organized play won't all of a sudden stop becoming a meme right I know that it's fun to to rag on us about that, but um, we'll have numbers to point to, and we'll have uh, videos of the gameplay, and we'll have people having fun. And I think that that's kind of the point. I want people to have fun with this. I want it to be taken seriously. I don't view those things as mutually exclusive. It's not going to be like you're sitting in a a white, you know, whitewashed uh, room with you know fluorescent lights and and everyone's taking the gameplay so seriously and, and no one's having fun because they're all there for money i think there's a good middle ground between that and you know fun gameplay that's overly casual absolutely, absolutely. um next question is how do you how do you qualify i know we how we qualify but how do you qualify for international players for this major event we're still figuring that out that's yeah. fair <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I, I know, um, you know, we're coming up on, it's two months from now, geez. Right. So, um, we're going to have to have a solution for them relatively soon. Um, the best way as a, as a international player is to, again, the hard road, talk to your local game store, get signed up on the MPN play.metazoogames.com, get an MZO trained qualify and then fly to the U S once you're qualified and play just like anybody else. And I know that that doesn't seem viable uh, for a lot of people, but I know for a fact that we have distribution in the UK um, and in Europe because I've seen the bills that they pay me. So either they're holding the product and they're not releasing it at all for the past five months, or it actually is in local game stores and people just need to do a better job of going out and finding it or telling their local game store to hook up with their distributor and get it at their store. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Um, with, wait, with online play uh, in the works and stuff like that, are there plans for online sanctioned events post caster cup and will they be a, a separate competitive scene or will there be some like overlap um, yeah, so once we get our online client set up, um, it, there will be sanctioned play on that. Um, I think that it, there would be things that are exclusive to that in the tournament scene, and then you know crossovers into physical tournaments as well. Um, I think that they're they are different skill sets in ways that people don't anticipate if they, for instance, only played online and haven't played in person. Um, it's kind of like playing online poker versus poker in person. Um, you have different, like there are different skill sets, especially if there's bluffing involved, especially if there's, um, you know, if you don't have the ability to grub hub food as you're playing online and, and, you know, it, some people, it, it's exhausting to play, right? Let's yep. be honest for hours and hours. Um, and, and so there's a certain amount of mental and physical fortitude needed to play in the physical format that doesn't cross over. But like, so to answer your question, uh, there will be things exclusive to both, to both, uh, um, I keep calling them formats, not formats, uh, to both um, play <laughs> formats. Um, um, but then there will be crossovers that I think uh, will be reasonable. But I'm not, I, you know, the, the online client is eight to nine months down the line. So it's something that will be a little bit more 
I, I want to think more deeply about it. Okay. Yeah. And I always say, you know, cause I played poker online and I used to play poker semi-professionally um, playing online and dealing with software instead of dealing with actual interactions with people and shuffling and stuff like that. I feel like it really makes a big difference. And so I'm glad that you have this and you're coming up with this solution for both. And uh, I much appreciate that. And yeah, I think, I think it'll be interesting to see, you know, cause I've seen people joke about this too. And I, and, and I hope that they don't think they're going to have an easy time, easy time with this uh, where, you know, it's a lot easier to, to cheat in person. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you cheat at the caster cup, for instance, we'll have <laughs> security escort you out. Um, like we're not, we're not going to play around with that. I mean, th- this is a lot of money. Um, it's life-changing money for some people. And if you think that you can come in and, and, um, you know, top shuffle, um, and get away with it because Kevin doesn't see you or anything like that, like you're, you're going to have a bad time. Right. Right. Um, so I will, I will say something in in that regards where, you know, we're, we're talking with channel fireball right now about running the whole event. Um, so, you know, they take that stuff very seriously and, and John say, so is a pretty tall, terrifying dude. And so am I, so (laughs) don't, don't come to the caster cup and ruin everyone's time thinking that you're going to cheat because we're, we're probably smarter than you and we'll catch you. And Michael, something to add on for that, because I know you are developing, you are coming up with new rules for stuff like that as a player in a situation where they feel like something's off or something. How do they go about that? Like, I feel like this is a great time to address this because there'll be rules in place and DQing. Um, how do they go about that? I mean, how are y'all placing that so that people are prepared that if they, if they feel something, see something or something's off, how do they conduct themselves? This is something where the expertise from someone like Channel Fireball will come in. Um, right. I'm sure that they have things in place in, in the, the coming weeks where we're, we hash out all the details. Um, I'll, I will defer to their expertise and, and and make announcements associated with what best practices will be. Okay. I awesome. will get, I will get to the next question. So, you know, you've been, we're now we're looking at a, almost a full year of actually competitive play, the tournaments that you have, you know, what, when it comes to the competitive players after a full year, what is your vision, you know, for this, for those competitive players? I mean, you think there's going to be rankings, hall of, hall of fame. I mean, I don't know if you're out there yet. You know, I've, I've kind of asked around, but I'm really curious on this. So we're going to be introducing rankings on the play.medizugames.com that are retrospective, uh, you know, in terms of how they're calculated um, this month, right? Uh, so that's going to be a thing, um, you know, depending outside of the competitive scene, depending on what your ranking is, you're going to get promo cards. You're going to get, you know, things like flights covered. So let's say that you... Um, are a top 10 player, you know, everywhere, right? Forget about a, a single caster's cup or, or tournament um, that will bring with it certain benefits, right? And, and that goes to what I want to do with this, which is I want people to, to be able to make a living off of playing MetaZoo. Um, I certainly make a living off of MetaZoo and it's pretty awesome. Um, and I think that that's the dream for anyone that plays uh, competitively is, is the ability to say, you know, Hey, I can make as much money playing met the zoo, um, as I would, you know, working a desk job, but I get to do it having fun. And in some cases you're going to make more than, uh, you know, VPs at, at a bank in New York city, because you're, you know, our, our purses are that large. Right. So, um, awesome. I want, I want these, I want these players, especially these early doctors to be rock stars. Um, that comes with it, certain ri- risks, right? Especially if that person, you know, that is a rock star, let's say that they aren't the biggest fan or best spokesperson for the game. Um, but then that that's part of being a company, right? It, where it's like, well, you know, this person, let's say who we're propping up and, you know, giving them a platform and they are a rock star and they're making money. Um, you know, they are representing the company in a way they're representing the community. And if they don't do that, well, I have zero qualms about snatching that away from them. Um, and we have the ability to do that at, at our discretion. Right. So my vision for these players is that you will 
maintain a sense of respect, professional decorum, um, and have fun as you make a little bit of money and, and you're part of a community that, um, you know, is proud to have you representative of them. Awesome. Awesome. That's Go ahead, really, Ethan. No, that's really, really cool. Um, I think with the news with other games, kind of like they're kind of shuffling their, their pro team to a little bit to the further back. Uh, this is really, really cool news. And also really, this is exclusive as far as like the news with Channel Fireball. So that's really cool. And we thank you for sharing that with us. Um, that's really, really big. Um, but my, I have another question with the Caster Cup qualifications being really heavily influenced by being playing or playing live. How does that work with like the local game stores and them having exclusive support like cards, tournament packs, trophies? Will you all provide them anything? And what does it look like? as far as like any of the support that they get so in april we're going to be releasing uh kits that get sent out to these these local game stores um you know the but the the understanding is that beyond like you know they'll be able to purchase these kits some of the, the stuff will be free um but you know the onus at least like, you know, in these initial stages, the onus should be a little bit on the local game stores to, to kind of put up, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is an investment on their part as well. Um, they are business men and women. Um, they should recognize that this is good for their business. And if they don't and they don't want to participate, that's fine. Um, I think it's, it's a balance though, right? Like I'm not going to, I'm not going to beg these local game stores to hold events. Um, they have to come to it on their own. Um, and, you know, I know that might be aggressive, but we're not a multi-billion dollar company like Magic the Gathering where we can send a bunch of free stuff. I'd rather take that support and put it towards the actual pricing. Um, I know for a fact that most of these stores have products to make available um, to their players if they actually want to put on events. Um, but, you know, we will be providing promo cards for local game store level events that want to put on events and, um, you know, have winners. And so those will be coming in April as well. Perfect. So this is for a, a seasonal thing, but do you think there ever will be like a seasonal schedule for individuals to prepare, especially for international players? So I think that the way that I would – envision it is we have a worlds, we have regionals, um, and we have, you know, citywide, uh, tournaments as well that have prize, you know, that have purses that really start at 50 to hundred K and then work its way up to, you know, I, I want next year's to be 1.25 million. Um, wow. and but, but, but we'll see, right? Like, I don't want to run uh, before we walk kind of thing. And I think organizing, you know, people, people who are critical of the Casters Cup, they're like, ah, they should really start with like regionals and, and create this whole tour and stuff. And it's like the logistics behind that are just absolutely enormous and, and, and difficult. And it's an undertaking that we're not prepared for. I want one really big event with a lot of money um, with, and I want to put the onus and I want to put the, the pressure on local game stores um, that the buck stops, starts and stops at them, right? If, if you want to qualify for these things for the cash cup, for the, the 250K, all you got to do is go to your local game store or be a local game store owner and put on one sanctioned event or participate in one sanctioned event. It's not, we're not asking a lot, guys. Um, now, when, when we have more of a, institutional experience built up where we've run the casters cup and we maybe, you know, next year we have two of them or something like that. And we, we start getting a little bit of experience under our belts. Then we can start thinking about uh, fragmenting that into a seasonal thing where there are multiple tiers or levels to, um, you know, the tournament scene, but right now one event with as much support as we can give it, the rest is up to the local game stores. 
sick. That's really cool. And I agree with you. And just from experience, you're, you're bringing like flashbacks as like me as a kid playing, playing uh, the card game like Yu-Gi-Oh and being able to qualify at your game store and getting the big, you know, millennium puzzle and then going off to regionals like that. That's what has to be created in this game. And I think you're, you're on the right track of like telling them, hey, look, this is, you know, this is what we need to do to develop this. And I look forward to seeing this. I look forward to being at the regionals. It, it's going to be amazing. It's yeah. Like, and, 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 you know, and, and people were like, oh, can't MetaZoo put on like an event at Spukala that, uh, Spukala, however the heck you pronounce it, <laughs> uh, where, you know, um, you qualify there. And it's like, no, like that's the point. The point is, is if we provide that as an out, then no local game store, no one's going to pressure the local game store to actually put on an event, like no shortcuts in this. And, and I know that's going to be painful, um, but like that, that's, we got to do this. Otherwise a, a year will go by and it, it doesn't matter how big MetaZoo gets because like, we won't be able to, to walk it back. Right. Like we won't be able to say like, Hey, now we're, you know, we're 10 times bigger than we were in, you know, the first uh, quarter of, of 2022 now let's really start taking competitive play seriously. Like we got to do it now. Sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah, that's, that's. No, that's we, we want to hear from you. This is why we have this. So I, we hear the passion. I know that I, if I didn't believe in you. I would not be here right now. I believe in what you're doing and your contingency plan, your 20 years. I've, I've researched it. Me personally, I don't want to get in all this, <laughs> but I have a finance accounting background. So it has, it has to make sense. And you're doing the steps to grow it. It's just developing because you took what other games, this is my personal opinion, other games uh, did wrong. And I think you're doing a phenomenal job and I look forward to see it develop. Yeah. And, and, you know, and on that front, the local game store scene is changing. The industry is in flux, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You have places like Magic the Gathering or companies like Magic the Gathering and sports cards, and they're moving more to a direct to consumer model. Um, while also, you know, walking back the pro tour stuff. And it's interesting. It's, it's, I think that MetaZoo is in an interesting place where we're developing our organized play, but we're also developing as a business. You know, we don't have a war, we don't have a war purse or war chest of a um, billion dollars to, to mess around with like Wizards does. Now, if we, you know, th- it's all delicate, right? Like if we don't, like we, we can't screw up Caster's Cup because it might impact our, our business bottom line and vice versa, right? These things are intricately connected, right? Uh, you know, we released our, our Kickstarter product a year ago, and now we're ponying up a quarter million dollars for organized play. It'll probably be closer to 350000 once all the other costs are, are taken into account and product and all other kind of stuff, right? Like that's a lot of money for a startup. Yeah, um, but but we're taking it very seriously. Um, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Easton. No, that thanks for the insight, Mike. On that, I was also wondering, um, just with like how we've seen with the NFT promo and Webby promo, the Alpha Investment promo. Do you think that like the players will have like a exclusive promo or card that you get outside of maybe like the participation medal for playing in a major event or even in like a, just being a competitor? Yeah, we're gonna. We, so um, we have three different types of promo packs at the Casters Cup. Um, you know, we're taking, I think it's 45 uh, silver and bronze cards from the past three sets, and we're making them full holographic. Um, and if you're a player, those are going to actually be stamped with player. And those will be exclusive wow. players. Um, so, and, and the, the player cards will actually have uh, cards in them that aren't available in just the normal collect collecticon caster cup packs. Mm-hmm. Um, and they'll actually be, I think four cards per pack. Mm-hmm. So, you know, um, we, you know, we're meta zoo, right? We're going to, we're going to take a bunch of promos and a bunch of special things and, and we're going to, we're going to sprinkle them all over the place and yeah, we'll make it special. So, um, you know, it's, it's caster's cup is, it's going to be entirely focused on, the player and it's going to be, but it's going to be collectible in its focus. If that makes sense. Cause you can be both. Yeah. If you're smart enough. You for sure. You for can. Sure. We all were collectors before we were players. We became yep. players because we love to collect. Exactly. 
So I leave you at this. Uh, we don't have any more questions, but you know, we have about about six minutes left. Do you have any questions for for us that have been playing this game? We've been at the top tables and winning the medals. Like, I'm just curious. Do you have any questions for us, the players? Um, I would love to hear your feedback as players. Um, and it doesn't have to be now, but like as we as we do think about the online clients. Uh, and what your experience has been with Tabletop Simulator. Um, like, what lessons can we take from that um, and make sure that we actually create an online client that, you know, is suitable and fits all the needs and, and kind of avoids the issues that are on Tabletop Simulator. Um, but other than that, like, I'm just interested in hearing what we can do better. I mean, you, you've heard my very aggressive take on the responsibility of local game stores to actually, you know, pony up and, and make this work. Um, but I could be wrong and, and, or, or rather I, you know, I could be thinking about it too, you know, linearly. Uh, what is your take on, on my approach and, and what could I do better? Yeah. And I think me and Easton can get back to you on that, you know, off here, but I would love to hear other people out, you know, I will have this on YouTube so they can actually comment and everyone can review that and get a player okay. pull comment as well from that so i think yeah. you're doing it right for both standpoints you know if if we can't if locals don't don't want to support it or do that what's the other you know alternative you know because the game's going to grow we want yeah. local card shops to grow with the game because clearly it's growing with or without the people that are not involved now right it, it you know yeah and so that that's the thing is is you know so as a card game you say support your local game store but we, what you're seeing in, in not just MetaZoo, but even mostly in, in places like Pokemon and 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 Magic the Gathering and Yu-Gi-Oh and Flesh and Blood is um, the reason to support your local game store is that they the reason as a businessman that I, I sell at a discount to local game stores is because they are supposed to be doing things for the community and that community creates longevity in the game and the brand and so on and so forth. What happens when that local game store is literally doing the opposite um, or, you know, not putting on events, not, you know, they're just taking the product and they're selling it online. Um, at that point, why wouldn't I just do that myself at MSRP and make three times as much money? Right. So, you know, we're, we're entering into this interesting space now where MetaZoo is taking competitive play very seriously, but we're in a LGS you know, point in the industry where um, maybe the local game store in mass approach isn't necessary. And then, so what is the alternative? The alternative is having a special set of local game stores or communities like Castro Society that are focused on, you know, community and MetaZoo partnering with them in a business perspective uh, because you guys are holding up that end of the bargain, which is, you know, you're, you're, you're selling MetaZoo, you're, you know, taking on MetaZoo as, as a, as a product that you represent, but you're also giving back to the community. I would rather, you know, kind of like qualifying for the Casters Cup. I'd rather have a hundred local game stores that get my product um, and engage in community building than a thousand local game stores uh, where, you know, 90% of them just flip it online. Um, so my question to everyone else kind of as my closing point is what is the alternative to getting MetaZoo at your local game store that you think is acceptable? And, and are you okay with, with MetaZoo um, hyper-focusing on partners and local game stores and societies like Castor Society that, um, really care about the player and the community more than, you know, making a profit. Yeah. Well, Michael, thank you so much. I know uh, we've been taking a lot of your time, you know, as always, we appreciate it. And we look forward to all the events. I know me and Easton are going to be at every one we possibly can be at. Uh, sure. It's just how it is competitive in, in us nature naturally. But uh, thank you for this time. And like I always tell everyone, always keep learning, always keep collecting. And like I run with my name, always keep running things up. So guys, thank y'all so much for joining us. Please leave comments below. 
Uh, for Michael, like I said, we said before, any questions that you might have, please leave it in the comment section. Thank you so much for your time, guys. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the interview and, and the opportunity to talk to both of you. Absolutely. Thank you.